Welcome to the Financial Flossing Podcast with Ross Brannan, guiding dental professionals to a brighter future. Ross Brannan is a financial advisor who knows it's not just about your teeth. He helps dental practice owners protect and maximize today's cash flow to plan for tomorrow's cash needs. Find him at rossbrannan.com. On the show, he brings together experts to help dental professionals looking to make smart money decisions to grow their income, turn their retirement goals into reality, and improve their lives. And now, here's your host, Ross Brannan. Welcome to the show. My guest today is Matthew Larson. Matthew is one of the two practicing orthodontists at Larson Orthodontics in Altoona, Wisconsin. The other one is his wife. Matthew, welcome to the show. <laughs> Thanks, Ross, for having me. Great to be on. Yeah, you have a unique story. Um, we have a lot of people on from all different areas of, of life and different dentists, general dentists, orthodontists, other uh, specialties. But you guys are orthodontist in up in Wisconsin, which, by the way, is the frozen tundra. And I'm sorry that you have to freeze yourself to death six months a year. But you kind of have an interesting story. You know, you're from Minnesota, went to school in Michigan. Your wife is from Minnesota. She also went to school in Michigan Dental School. You did undergrad there. You guys yep. met kind of just through circumstance when you guys were in residency on the East Coast. Uh, you got married and you ended up moving back to Wisconsin where your wife is from and you started a practice from scratch and that takes some guts and it takes some perseverance and you guys did it. So talk a little about how all that happened. You know, it was <laughs> the process of a lot of long conversations and a lot of long nights looking at kind of the option, you know, with two of us coming out of school fresh as orthodontists, there's not a whole lot of practices that wanted to take two on at one time. <laughs> so, you know, trying to find an opportunity where we can both live in the same spot, which would be quite nice with your spouse, what was challenging to find something. And eventually we kind of came to the conclusion that if we wanted something like that, we'd have to kind of make it for ourselves, which led us to really seriously to look at starting up. And it was a scary process right from the start, looking back on it worked out incredibly well and I, I'd urge other people to consider it but I still remember that stress of trying to start it all up a lot of hard decisions coming out of it now you worked as an associate both of you worked as associates one day a week in a town like an hour away to kind of at least help somewhat pay the bills because you weren't generating a ton of revenue in your new practice to start so talk a little bit about that I'd urge everyone to kind of do something similar I mean for one thing most bank loans will require you to do something like that to have a little bit of side income to make sure that you have money to take home at the end of the day. You know, these little things called student loans that <laughs> tend to trick the life. But, uh, you know, it also was great because we had the steady one day a week jobs that really got us some continuity with patient care, taught us a lot about seeing more patients in a day. And we also would do some, you know, side jobs for just locum fill in work from a bunch of different offices. So in the span of that first year, we had filled in at 15 or 20 different offices and seen how things worked, what worked and didn't at those locations, how staff delegated and ran different things in different offices and, and just how the whole operation ran. Gave us a lot of ideas of what to do, a lot of ideas of what we didn't want to do in our practice. But it was incredibly helpful for trying to to, to build the systems that you want in your own practice. So what are the biggest challenges that, that you faced and that most people will face starting a practice from scratch? I think the biggest thing is just all the decisions that have to be made. I mean, it, it's just a never ending list that you can kind of start seeing it on a piece of paper, but instead, you, in, until you get into the, all the decisions, you don't really realize how many decisions have to be made from the bank loan to the business plan to buying the equipment to, to every last system in your office has no history behind it. So when you bring that first team member on, how are they trained? When are they trained? When it transitions over, did any of that get written down for the next one to be trained in after that? And then just how you, how you actually get people in the door. I mean, you know, got to start with one, get the one person in the door to start the process and get it together. So, I mean, really, if I could go back and do one thing better, it would be the, the marketing on the front end to make sure that the word of mouth got out about our practice being open. Well, you told me a story uh, offline about how the marketing was, you wish you had done better because you, you're in your wife's hometown and you guys end up meeting people 
who could have been your uh, patients, but they weren't. So talk about that for a second. Right. So, I mean, we'd have dinners out that we went to meet some of my wife's old friends from high school and they'd have braces on that they got a couple months before, not realize my wife was back in town. And so, I mean, that, that kind of stings a little when you're, when you're there, you basically have a, the benefits of going back to your hometown in terms of knowing people and having connections aren't worth a whole lot unless you get that word out there that everyone, that you're back and, and ready to see people. So what have you done marketing wise now that you're established, you're coming on 10 years, what have you done uh, marketing wise or do you feel like, or do you do not do marketing at all? Yeah, it, you know, it shifts year by year and we keep trying new things and finding what what works and doesn't. In our community, having good connections with some of the local, you know, sports teams and schools and doing some sponsorship there really goes a long way. Early on, honestly, I don't think we got a better return than just some direct mailers. And I mean, it costs some money and in the traditional world, I mean, people tell you to look at a lot more digital advertising and we do a lot of that now and it works very well. But still the word of mouth we generated by just getting a couple of direct mailers out there at the start, I, I think was second to none uh, for us in our location, at least. Were there a lot of classmates of yours from dental school and residency who thought you were crazy for starting from scratch instead of going to do something else first? A little bit, yeah. When we started actually reviewing the numbers after a year or two, they didn't think I was crazy anymore and it started working out well. And then give it a couple of years after that and they were all looking to join me. But early on in the process when we were just getting going, yeah, I mean, it was definitely stressful. They definitely was a couple of moments where they had me almost talked out of it, but uh, I'm, I'm glad we made the jump. <laughs> So is this one of those situations where if you'd have known what you were walking into, you wouldn't have done it, but because you didn't know, you did it, and you're really glad you did it? You know, I think I still, looking back at all, would would do it. Um, but I'm, you know, I think it's one of those things that my younger brother is actually an orthodontist as well. There's there's too many of us in the family, but uh, is he in he the same town? To, uh, he's down in Rochester, Minnesota, so my my hometown. So he okay. went down to to our hometown. But he was starting dental school right when I was graduating, was my assistant in boards. And as we were leaving boards on the elevator, a bunch of my classmates and I all discussed, like, if we had to go through it all again, we had to do all the boards and go through all the schooling again, would we do it? And all of us were like, no. <laughs> and that was his experience to starting the whole process. So it's kind of similar with the startup. You know, I, I really, it's been such a good experience at the end of the day, I, I would absolutely do it again, but I wouldn't really want to go relive those first six months again. <laughs> right. So talk about working with your wife. So my wife worked with me when we were engaged before we were married. And this was, you know, like 17 years ago. And she says she quit. I say I fired her. So we we could not, we cannot work together at all. I can compartmentalize work and family. She can't. She would probably yell at me if she heard me say that. But mm -hmm. how's that dynamic work with you and your wife? You know, there, there's definitely challenges. I mean, we had to figure out over the years the, the boundaries of what has to stay at work and what can come home because when we're seeing patients and we're busy all day, some things still have to be managed after hours. Um, but if you let it, it'll occupy every waking moment when you're home as well. I mean, it's the kind of standard issues with owning your own business, but just multiplied because you're doing it also with your spouse. So we always, we're, we're coming up on our 10 year anniversary and always say that we're, it's probably like should be considered our 30th. But uh, at the end of the day, I think it's made us stronger. We, there's no one else I'd rather do it with, but it definitely has challenges when you have to go home to the same person. So do you now, do both of you work every day of the week or do some of you work, do you work four days a week? And is, is your four days different than her four days? Yeah, we alternate a little bit. So we typically are each three to four days a week. So there's a couple days of combined coverage in there, but then we also have some administrative time built in. We always, from the start, had talked about doing kind of one super orthodontist practice. So not really a full, full two doctor where we're both working full time and can't take any time off. We knew we wanted kids. We knew we wanted kind of a, you know, balance with our home life as well. And I've really tried to stick with that as we've grown. We just built a new office this year. And so we now have the space that we can actually operate out of the same spot together a lot more efficiently. So we're finding our new balance there and have been enjoying kind of having more time in the same office. 
prior to that, we were kind of in two different locations and we could practice separately, but we didn't really have the staff to man them both as efficiently as we'd like. And then just trying to transport between a satellite and having everything going at the same time just caused a lot of headaches. So we're, we're happy to be kind of reduced back to the one location, having both of us there. We still have far more clinic chairs. We had four chairs in one location, three at the other. We now have merged into a nine chair office. So we've still definitely had some growth with everything there. So a lot and more efficient. A lot more efficient. So Re- really nice to have everything in the same spot. I mean, half of our headaches were organizing, preparing supplies and making sure Invisalign was packed up and everything to for the satellite location. Really nice to have that all in one spot now. So who's kind of taken the natural leadership of, of CEO or chief boss? Is it you or her? We've kind of divided and conquered with a couple with, with different aspects of that. So she she normally handles a bit of the marketing and some of the HR side of the, the practice. And then I'll typically handle the oversight of the ordering, the financial review, um, the, the lab, a lot of the digital workflow. So Invisalign, we do a lot of in-office aligners and 3D printing. So making sure that's all running efficiently is kind of more the, the aspects that I'll take on in the practice. So you guys have done a really good job of delegating roles where she focuses on one side, you focus on the other side. We also feel that's healthy for the relationship. Yeah. <laughs> Probably pretty wise. Yeah. Probably pretty wise. So talk about, you know, in the beginning, you know, cash flow is a crunch. You got debt service you got to pay. You got to get people in the, in the door. Talk about the stress of managing cash flow in those lean times in the beginning and what you guys did to really get patients in the door. I think one of the benefits is we had just come out of school. So, I mean, we weren't used to any uh, larger lifestyle or, or cash income. We were used to li- uh, living off of student loans. Right. And so we we just basically said, we're going to keep that lifestyle for another year or two, rented a, an apartment a bit nicer than we would have gotten in residency, but uh, right. there you not go. a whole lot more. And really just, we had some extra time because we didn't have a lot of time and other associates, we had some, but not uh, our whole time committed. And so we put the rest of the time into really trying to build up systems at the office, going out and getting involved in as many community events and chamber of commerce events as we could, and really just kind of building up connections in the community. The amount of time we spent out in the community has been less recently since we've gotten busier. So, I mean, we still try to get involved with a lot, but the you know, it's a lot of kids' activities and, and that kind of stuff as it's gone on. But early on, it was just really just hammering out with time in the practice to, to get anyone and everyone in the door. And we have plenty of time to see those people as they came in. How much competition is in? Uh, you started in Eau Claire and you're in Al- yep. Al- Altoona now. What's the population of Eau Claire? It's around 60, 70,000, but they say that the mall area and the surrounding areas with kind of farmland around draws from almost 200,000. So it's, so it's the, got a bit of area. So, so the metropolitan statistical area is 200,000 people, roughly. Yeah. How many orthodontists are in that area? Currently, there's, there's three different orthodontic offices, us and two others. When we came, there was actually already four existing offices. So, but you, put two two of them, so you put two out of business. We we acquired that's a joke. One that's a, joke. <laughs> that's a yeah, yeah. joke. So okay, so do you feel like that's a lot of competition or a little bit of competition? I feel like it's really in the middle. One of the practices, that especially, really has tried to grow as much as possible. Um, you know, even prior to us coming, and is really I think can't even keep track sometimes. But I think he's got twenty different office locations around the state, kind of getting into more of that DSO. OSO strategy. Um, so, I mean, there's definitely been some strong competition from them where, you know, for the number of practices, it, it seems like a lot more. Just, we definitely still have to put in some marketing effort. We still have to treat patients right. We still have to get word of mouth out there. We still have to have a good reputation. It's not like you open the doors and they'll hang a shingle and they'll suddenly show up. But it's also been an environment where we haven't, you know, been as crazy as like, you know, some of my friends in Arizona or Florida, where there's, you walk another two blocks down the street and there's another two offices that just started up as well. Um, so that's been nice. How much of a challenge is, or is it, a, is it a challenge at all with general dentists getting into the, into the Invisalign space? It's something of one. Um, at the end of the day, you know, 
We have the opportunity where we see a lot more of it that I really think that although we're there, the specialists and sometimes the price points are, are different, but I mean, we have the potential where we can show a significant difference and even make that price point better for people, depending on what's going on. You know, even going to the extreme of, you know, some of those aligners are now marketed just directly to the consumers at home with like a Smile Direct Club or Direct to Consumer program. You know, that kind of very limited movement that it works well for, we can do those things in, off, in our own office with in-house aligners and, and 3D print them ourselves without going through an outside lab and, and really price that at a point where it's very feasible. Kind of the same when you get into the moderate range stuff that, you know, might be treated with Invisalign at a general dental office. You know, we we see that that's, that's our bread and butter and we can do it really, really well. And so I, it's been something that we compete with off and on as time goes on. But in general, it seems like more and more people end up coming to see us and, and like seeing the results and just the easy appointments and it all runs really smooth. You know, I see this as a wonderful Saturday, and li- Saturday Night Live skit where a bunch of orthodontists get together and do, do a spiff or, or a spoof on Smile Direct Club. And like yeah. before, before and after, that would be a phenomenal Saturday Night Live type of YouTube clip for some orthodontists to put together. Unfortunately, it would probably go viral and it would probably end up getting some lawsuits and uh, yeah. um, and you would be loved by half and hated by half. But it would be really funny in the short term. I would see it. I would watch it. I'd, I'd be involved. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so 10 years in, you're successful now. You've made it. Looking back. 10 years ago, or even as you teach at residencies, what do you tell kids now? And uh, what would you do different? In terms of some of that, you know, we we really tried to, like I said, put in the effort up front to get systems in place. I don't think you can do that enough. I don't think you can build your brand enough at the beginning. I don't think you can write enough things down for how you want the systems to run. I don't think you can plan ahead enough on, on the next step of growth because you'll You'll never have as much time as when you were not as busy at the start. Um, the, the further on you go, finding that administrative time and that time to sit back and look at systems, it just doesn't happen again the same way that it did in the past. Just life gets busy and it, it gets more challenging the, the longer time goes on. So, I mean, we I felt like we did really good the first couple of years for managing, bringing on the first couple of staff. And then when we went from you know, one front desk and one assistant the first year to now we've got six front desk and six assistants and then we kind of have another float. So we kind of alternate between 12 and 13 on the team. It's a totally different environment. And, you know, just like a lot of different things, if it's not written down, it it doesn't happen. You can kind of train, but you got to have things down for the systems. You got to have goals set and written down or they don't ever get checked again, including the, you know, the financial goals, including just the business operations goals, including patient care goals in terms of when people get done on time and, and how many new patients you have coming through the door, what percent of them start and how that all works. So that would be my biggest thing I would change in terms of that part of it. So you teach at a uh, dental school. What advice? University of Minnesota. Yep. Okay. What advice do you give them? Or if you don't, what advice would you give them if someone came up to you <laughs> at class and said, hey, Dr. Larson, give me some advice. Like what advice would you give to a new dental school grad? So, you know, I still think it's a great profession to go into. I know there's some talk uh, in different places that it, dentistry is not what it once was or orthodox isn't what it once was or the future will change as more and more acquisition happens from DSOs and OSOs. There's probably some grain of truth to that. I mean, the more, the less ownership we have in our own profession, I think the harder it is to make it what you want to be, which it kind of goes back to the advice I'd give, which is try to get ownership in your profession, both in terms of practice ownership. I mean, there's nothing wrong with going and working for a DSO or an OSO, but uh, by the same token, the the biggest financial benefits are going to be when you own your practice and your business owner as well. And the biggest way you can kind of make a difference in their profession is also getting involved in the, the profession as well. And so I help out with the American Association of Orthodontics and a couple of different committees, you know, connect with peers that way. I feel like it helps both just grow professionally, but it also, you know, helps direct where everything is going with the profession as a whole. Um, I'm on the Committee for Technology is one of the, the roles I serve on as on the AAO. And we just recently 
basically over the last year created a buying group for 3D printing so that all the resources and implementation for 3D printers is available to AEO members online um, with discounted pricing, video walkthroughs of how to do that for in-house aligners. And, you know, it's one more way to take that and, and put it back into our own hands and, and drive our own future going forward. That's really interesting. So I'm a big reader. You're a big rower. If I didn't yeah. mention earlier, you rode in Michigan. <laughs> um, you have 15 million miles. Is it 15 million miles uh, on your rower? Meters. Meters. I'm not quite meters. the 15 million miles. That would be a little wild, but. <laughs> That's, it's still ridiculous. So um, you're a better person than I, but I read a lot. And so I always ask people what uh, what they're reading, what they've read, or what they recommend. And as we wrap this up, do you have any book recommendations? Yeah, well, it, as a rower, I'd be amiss if I didn't mention Boys in the Boat. I don't know if you've read that, but it's about the the story of the Olympic team kind of during World War II and, and the rise of the Germany Olympics. Um, and then the struggles they faced getting over and competing over there. And a very, very cool story, very well written. In terms of recent ones that I've been reading, uh, Extreme Ownership by Jocko Williams. So just good for, you know, he's the, the military guy and, and taking full responsibility for everything that happens in your practice. The, the you know, extreme ownership, you, there's no bad teams, there's bad leaders. <laughs> and really reevaluating all the decisions that you can do yourself to, to drive change within your team. That's good. I'm a big Jocko fan. I like him a lot. And uh, he's pretty no holds barred. So that's great. Matt, this has been really fascinating. And I, I like hearing the story of how you just kind of laid it out on the table and said, we're going to start a practice from scratch. I don't think I don't think not as many people do that as, as the general public thinks. And it, it takes some guts to do that. And so I, I applaud you for your your perseverance and your grit, and obviously it's, it's, it's working out well for you. This has been a fascinating conversation. I really appreciate your time today. Thanks so much for having me. You've been listening to the Financial Flossing Podcast with Ross Brandon. Tune in next week for our next episode. This has been another episode of Financial Flossing with Ross Brandon, guiding dental professionals to a brighter future. If you liked what you heard, consider subscribing wherever you listen to podcasts. For more on Ross Brannan, visit rossbrannan.com. Registered representative and financial advisor of Park Avenue Securities, LLC, PAS, OSJ, 3664 Coolidge Court, Tallahassee, Florida, 32311, 850-562-9075. Securities products and advisory services offered through PAS, member FINRA, SIPC. Financial representative of the Guardian Life Insurance Company of America, Guardian, New York, New York. PAS is a wholly owned subsidiary of Guardian. North Florida Financial is not an affiliate or subsidiary of PAS or Guardian. California Insurance License Number 0L10073. Arkansas Insurance License Number 16139032. 2021 1195.35. Expires 423. That last part can also say 2021 119535, expiration April 2023. This podcast is for informational purposes only. Guest speakers and their firms are not affiliated with or endorsed by PAS, Guardian, or North Florida Financial, and opinions stated are their own. Ross is a registered representative and financial advisor of Park Avenue Securities, LLC, PAS, OSJ, 3664, Coolidge Court, Tallahassee, Florida, 32311. 850-562-9075. Securities products and advisory services offered through PAS member FINRA SIPC, financial representative of the Guardian Life Insurance Company of America, Guardian, New York, New York. PAS is a wholly owned subsidiary of Guardian. North Florida Financial is not an affiliate or subsidiary of PAS or Guardian. Arkansas Insurance License Number 16139032. California Insurance License Number 0L10073. 2022-135129. Expiration 324.